Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Matke and welcome to Ask the Mayo Mom on Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm a pediatrician at Mayo Clinic Children's Center in Rochester, Minnesota and host of this show about pediatric health topics. Today, we will be talking about peanut allergy in children. Recently, new treatment options have become available to those living with severe peanut allergies. We will be exploring what's new and what might be coming available in the next few years. Joining us for this discussion is Dr. Marty Hartz. Dr. Hartz is a pediatric allergist immunologist at Mayo Clinic Children's Center and is also an assistant professor of medicine and pediatrics. If you're listening live, please remember to send in your questions and we'll do our best to try to answer them during the live broadcast today. Dr. Hartz, thank you so much for joining us again today. Thank you, Dr. Mapke. Um, this is a really, really exciting topic um, and I am I'm I'm very like on edge just waiting to hear kind of what's new because I think there's so many patients and families that have been waiting for these kind of treatment options for so many years. Yeah, I agree. Uh, throughout my career, yeah. uh, I suddenly, after so many years of just telling people to try to avoid what they are allergic to and carry an EpiPen, we finally have some additional things to, to offer. So, yeah. yeah. It's really exciting. So I, before we get into kind of what are the are the potential treatments to, to reduce severity of these, these reactions, let's start by understanding, do we know what specifically causes allergies to peanuts in children? Um, there's some immune mechanisms that I won't get into, but um, <laughs> one of the ways that people develop food allergy is via their skin. So kids that have eczema have a high risk of getting food allergies. And what happens is the food allergen gets into the body and then your immune system makes little antibodies to the food allergen. And then if that patient or a person encounters that food allergen again and binds those antibodies, then your certain cells called mast cells spit out all kinds of things that make you get hives and flushing and potentially swelling and uh, vomiting and diarrhea and uh, all those signs of anaphylaxis that uh, patients can have. And peanut is a very common allergy. It's um, the most common cause of fatal food anaphylaxis. The fortunate part is that Given patients' diligence in avoiding and carrying EpiPen, there are very few fatalities per year. However, it causes a lot of anxiety in families and decreases quality of life. So, yeah, I would agree. Just you know, from from family and friends that do live with peanut allergies, you you do see how it affects even the kids every day. They're so diligent about asking, you know, anytime they eat anything, is there peanuts and their peanuts in it? It's just something that not everyone else has to think about. So yeah, definitely. So let's get into talking about what's new in in treating peanut allergies. And I guess we should maybe define like when we say treating, what does that mean? Does it mean it completely eliminates the food allergies? Um, or is it more just kind of diminishing the severity of the response? So they're not at higher risk for severe um, anaphylaxis? Um, it's both, actually. Okay. Ideally, we would um, give someone the ability to not be allergic and um, be able to eat the food whenever they like and never have to worry about it again. And mm -hmm. there's a name for that, sustained oral tolerance. But basically, it just means you, we've cured it. <laughs> um, we, we haven't gotten to that point. So most of the treatments at this point are reducing your chance of getting an allergic reaction. Um, the currently, uh, currently, there's only one FDA-approved treatment, and that's called Palforzia, and it's oral or immunotherapy, meaning almost like taking allergy shots, only you're taking it by mouth by giving tiny amounts of the food allergen until you can take a certain amount that um, makes you less likely to have um, a reaction from an accidental ingestion. There's also some other treatments that are in the works, um, some anti-IgE treatments, 
uh, where it binds that antibody that causes the peanut allergy, some other treatments um, that have been approved for other allergic diseases, which we can discuss as well. Um, those aren't approved, but one of them, the anti-IgE treatment may be approved within the next year. And that would be helpful for patients that have more than a peanut allergy or other allergies other than peanut allergy. So, well, that's really exciting. Let's um let's get into talking about palforzia because that's the one that's currently available for for <laughs> children of certain ages. And then I want to hear about a little bit more about what's potentially coming to market because I'm sure a lot of um, knowledgeable parents are asking me about these because they're seeing them in clinical trials and, mm -hmm. um, you know, curious of when that's going to be widely available. So, um, so what is palforzia? You said oral immunotherapy. Is that, is yeah. that correct? Okay. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about it. Okay. So palforzia um, is different than peanut itself because each of the parts of the peanut, if you eat a peanut, Ha, there's a whole bunch of different allergens in it. So what palforzia is, is peanut protein, just like what you might peanut powder, like you buy, buy at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. PB2 powder is one that's um, a trade name, but mm -hmm. um, this has controlled for all those different parts so that it makes it safer mm. than just if we picked the peanut powder off the shelf at the grocery store. So you have these, the special peanut powder and we start with very tiny amounts and then increase it every two weeks until patients reach um, the amount that's of protein that's contained in a single peanut. Okay. So then the patient is able to basically eat a peanut a day and that's what they do. So okay. Um, the way it's approved, once you reach that um, final level, then uh, patients continue on with the palforzia at the equivalent dose of a peanut. And, um, and we don't know how long, uh, if that's going to be an indefinite thing, or if at a certain point, it becomes a cure because it hasn't been around long enough. But the mm -hmm. way it's approved is for now, you continue that. And the, the part that is makes patients excited about it and those that enroll are, um, are because most of the time you, you eat less than a peanut. The accidental ingestions are usually trivial ingestions. And so it, you don't have to, parents and patients don't have to be so hyper vigilant about very tiny accidental ingestions. So it's um, for patients, especially patients where that's their only food allergy, um, it impacts it markedly improves their quality of life. And that's what we're after. Because as mm -hmm. I said earlier, most people don't have vast numbers of accidental ingestions because they have to be so hypervigilant. This way you can relax a little bit about um, trivial ingestions. Now, it does not mean you can eat a peanut butter sandwich, um, but over long-term, there's lots of studies going on about what, how long you might have to stay on that. Could we switch it to a food? Could we eventually increase the amount that people take per day? So it's, it doesn't mean forevermore you're going to be taking pel Pelforzia once a day. But mm -hmm. for now, yes, when patients reach that, they continue on taking a, the equivalent of a peanut a day. So. Okay. So who's the, what ages are, is this currently approved for? Is it only children or are adults available as well? Um, it's only for children. Um, it's from age four to um, when you hit 18, you can't, it's, you're no longer an, eligible to enroll. But if you start it before your 18th birthday, you then can continue on, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it seems as though younger children tolerate it better. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but we certainly are enrolling teenagers. Um, there are high risk times when, when people have accidental ingestions. One is in the preschool years where uh, 
the patients can't fend for themselves. They usually eat what's given to them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, adolescents, when they're doing things more on their own and may not always remember their EpiPens or <laughs> are challenging authority. And so some sometimes those are those that's also a high risk period. The third high risk period for accidental ingestions is when p patients leave home to go to college. And so we've had some patients that uh, want to do it before they leave. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they get the updosing done before they go off to uh, school and out in the world. So. Yeah. It sounds like you said about a six month kind of treatment protocol yeah. or process. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about like what's sure. involved and is there testing and, and certain yes. follow-ups? Absolutely. Okay. okay. So the first thing is you have to have a peanut allergy. And by that, we mean you have to experience the symptoms of having the allergy. So you've had some sort of ingestion or challenge and you um, get hives or what, you know, what have you, vomiting, diarrhea. And then, um, and then we do testing and we need recent testing to show that you are still sensitive. If you had lost your sensitivity, then we might want to do a challenge because we certainly wouldn't want you to put a put you on a prolonged therapy if you didn't need it. So um, we do blood testing and skin testing, and we expect both of those to be positive. And and then you would be a candidate for for the treatment and. We enroll you in a um, a risk mitigation program because we are giving the food that you're allergic to. There's a third party, the way the FDA approved it, there's a third party that ma uh, monitors things to make sure that we're doing things safely um, mm -hmm. as an approved site. And, um, and then you come in for your first day, get the equivalent of one one hundredth of a peanut. Wow. You, <laughs> yeah. you tolerate that, then you come back and every two weeks we increase the dose. And of course, at first we're starting really slow. And then at, as we see if you would tolerate it, we go higher and higher on the dose um, every two weeks. So, so the first visit is about four to five hours. The vis the updosing visits, which yeah. there are like 12 of them, um, which is how it adds up to six months. Um, they last about an hour and a half, I would say, because we, we check you out, give you the dose and then observe for an hour and then we can dismiss you home. Um, so sometimes there's some delays. You can't do it if you're if you're ill, um, because that lowers the threshold that you would have um, an a uh, anaphylactic reaction. It does. Ch so you do have to commit yourself to coming in every two weeks. So it means um, children may potentially have some time away from school, um, and then. Um, generally at the home dosing in between the up doses, we have you give uh, with dinner. So we want the child quiet after for several hours afterwards. So that's a good, seems to be a good time of day when kids are doing homework or other things, getting ready for bed and um, not as active because that lowers your threshold of having an allergic reaction. Mm. So Interesting. Mm -hmm. Is it a pill that they swallow? I saw it comes in a pill or is it something that's opened up and put on, on other food? It's opened up. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the little capsules. So we, when you come in, assuming you tolerate the dose, we send you with a little um, cooler pack um, and give you all the doses for the coming two weeks. And then at night you open the, the, capsule, sprinkle it on their food. When you've reached the full dose, then they send you what are called sachets where you just open them up and sprinkle it on the food. So yeah. And so we want um, want kids to take it with food because that dilutes it down a little bit and it takes a little longer to be absorbed and lowers the reaction threshold for a reaction. So 
Okay. So I think that um, one one question that I've, I've heard from families is, is this covered by insurance or is it some type of prior authorization process that would need to go through before patients can kind of start yeah. this treatment protocol? Yeah. So, um, so we make sure that people understand what the process is. So we spend quite a bit of time um, discussing all the details of this with patients. And then from a nursing standpoint, our nurses spend a, a lot of time. And as soon as we've gone through that, then that initiates our prior authorization okay. process. And um, it's an expensive therapy because the peanut is because of they're controlling for all those proteins to make sure each mm -hmm. dose is the exact same composition. So, um, so yes, it, it, all, all insurances, we um, require prior, prior authorization. Um, and we have not yet had um, anyone deny it. So, um, and then the, also there is a program if it would get denied where mm -hmm. the company can potentially support that for patients where their insurance wouldn't cover it, but we really haven't had to use that. So. That's really, really exciting. Um, yeah. I, I'm sure you've, you've had some patients go through the, the program so far and, and has it have the responses been positive? Yeah. Or, yeah. It's, it's wonderful because um, we've had our very first patient um, sent us a nice, adorable letter about how, um, how great it was to be able to go to school. So, she never felt comfortable sitting among her friends. She wanted to be off in the peanut yeah. table and now she feels comfortable. Um, oh. And she really, she and her mother both feel like it's really um, improved her qu quality of life. Um, so we, we've, um, and so, yeah, I think most of the patients that enroll, we emphasize that's, that's the value is quality of life. If you don't think it's going to improve your quality of life, then it's not the right treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and the patients that it may not improve their quality of life are patients that have multiple food allergies and they say, yeah, it might help my peanut, but um, I'm still mm -hmm. reading labels and carrying yeah. pen and very concerned about all the tree nuts I'm allergic to. Mm -hmm thus and such so well I, that, I mean that's a perfect segue you had mentioned that there is something that's being studied for anti-IgE treatment that might treat patients with multiple food allergies was that correct yes okay yeah. and what what type of treatment is is that process okay being studied to be given as yeah so uh, what's what's really exciting about this is that it may be approved. The, the estimation is it'll be approved within the next year. Wow. Um, it's a treatment. It's called, uh, the trade name is Zolaire. It's omelizumab. Mm -hmm. um, it was approved almost 20 years ago, initially for severe asthma. Yeah. And yeah. So I was like, I know this name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And patients, uh, we, there had been some studies on similar medications that showed it worked for food allergy. And then pay, you, you get real life, um, patients saying, uh, I was started on this from my asthma and I accidentally ate whatever, and I didn't react. So it lowers. So it has a lot of good side effects, um, meaning patients that need it for their asthma, severe, moderate to severe asthma, their allergies um, seem to be less problematic, their eye and nose symptoms, mm -hmm. their food, all their food allergies seem, it seems to increase the threshold with which they would react to, to those foods. So those are all anecdotal things that mm -hmm. needed to be proved with scientific studies. And so far, when you um, take patients and divide them into this patient gets placebo, this patient gets, um, uh, the uh, Z Zolaire, um, and then challenge them, they uh, it requires 
a very substantial amount more peanut to trigger a reaction. And then that also is true for, it's been studied for um, tree nuts and other egg milk uh, food allergies as well. So, um, so we're looking for that to be approved. Um, it's the Zolaire, you may have heard the, I'm using the trade name because the omelismab is <laughs> kind of a hard one to remember, mm -hmm. but it's used for um, other things like hives. It's used for nasal polyps. So we have the good, the other good part is we have a lot of experience with the medication, with getting prior authorizations, because it also is an expensive medication. Mm -hmm. Um, experience in giving the uh, patient self-administer. It's an injectable medicine um, training. So, so I think it would be fairly easy to incorporate as an option. And it's really um, exciting for our patients that say, you know, Pelforzi is a great idea, but um, it's not going to really make me feel better because mm -hmm. I have... Um, I have so many other allergies, so. Yeah, well, that, that's, that is really exciting that there will yeah. potentially be other things to kind of help um, patients on the horizon. Was there, was there any other um, new drugs that you yeah. wanted to talk about? Yeah, sure. So there are some, so a lot of these conditions, as people know, um, asthma, allergies, food allergy, all of a lot of these conditions run together in people and in families because the root is the, you know, a, a atopic immune system, the allergic immune system. So uh, other drugs that are used for other conditions, like uh, particularly asthma, a lot of these, what we call biologicals have been approved for severe asthma also have effects on other allergic conditions. And so food allergy being one of them, those are also being studied as well. There's also um, some studies on what's called epicutaneous immunotherapy. And what it, that is, this little patch containing the allergen and the nice thing about that is you can do multiple food allergies and patches are put mm. in the middle of your back and, nice. uh, and, and they're moved around. And so it typically, it would be more along the lines of palforzia where it reduces the chance of trivial ingestion would cause symptoms, but um, it's not going to be a cure. The previous trials did not go through the FDA because there wasn't enough um, evidence that it reduces your reactivity, but new trials are being done that um, sh that have changed the dosing somewhat. And so that's a possibility too, is epicutaneous immunotherapy. Um, and then the other thing is combination things. So patients that have um, either peanut allergy and didn't tolerate or uh, oral immunotherapy or um, patients with multiple food allergies could get the oral, the OIT, the oral immunotherapy, along with, say, anti-IgE or these biologicals that make it less likely they would react. So combining these things. So there's so many exciting things in terms of um, research, uh, combining therapies, different, um, different types of therapies, whether it be, you know, general, all food allergies, specific allergies. So finally, for so many years, my practice, uh, not having something to offer patients or to look forward to in terms of treatment, I think uh, we're all very excited about that. So yeah, it's an exciting time to be an allergist, immunologist, yes. I would say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Especially with the, um, the, the, I think, the idea of really trying to prevent um, peanut allergies, especially with yes. with the way things have changed a lot with how we encourage early introductions of some of these allergens. Can you just talk a little bit about that for, for sure. parents that may be listening that have, yeah, have young yes. little six-month-olds that they can start working with? Absolutely. Okay. So a long time ago for uh, not very good reasons, we used to worry <laughs> that... Um, 
eating allergenic foods early would actually trigger food allergy. And it turns out when uh, populations of um, across the world where food allergic foods were fed early in babies um, actually had lower risk of food allergy. So that sort of flipped everything uh, on its head. And um, there were some good studies that show if you introduce allergenic foods early, you help prevent, you reduce, it's not 100%, but you reduce the chance it, in the case of peanut uh, by 80% that you would, your child would get a food allergy. And so that's hard for families if they have, you know, to say, okay, I'm worried about this food. Um, and now I'm going to start feeding it to my uh, four to six month old, which mm -hmm. is the recommendation. So the one, the, the high risk patients are the ones where we really focus on. So patients that have uh, particular, another food allergy, particularly egg identified early or severe eczema, because as I was saying before, you can get that allergy antibody by the food passing in uh, via the skin. Those patients, we can say, oh, they're really high risk of peanut allergy. So how, how do we prevent that? We, we give it by mouth, because if you give it by mouth, and it, you know, the child is consuming the food, it gives them a tolerance. It's, you can think of it like we're sort of desensitizing them from it because we're letting them eat that. And patients that have severe eczema, we almost treat it like a medication where it's given, um, if, if you can tolerate it three, three times a week, um, for for years, frankly. So if your child, if your baby has severe eczema, though, we don't want you to just start this up. We want you to talk to your pediatrician and say um, maybe get a screen. Um, those those very high risk patients, we uh, ask providers to get a screen to see if they're at risk of a peanut allergy. If so then um, sent to us and we do a skin test. And depending on the size of the skin test, we would do a challenge to get the maximal number of babies that are at high risk, able to eat those foods, um, eat specifically peanut early. Now, what about all the other food allergies? So just to <laughs> review, uh, egg, milk, soy, wheat, peanut, tree nut, fish, and shellfish, and maybe sesame. So if your family eats them, then your babies are getting micro exposures to those foods. So those ones via the skin, you can measure whatever your family eats, we can measure that food in the environment. So all those allergenic foods your family eats, whenever the texture is right, when, when your baby can take that texture of food, that's when you introduce it. And then once you introduce it, um, then keep it in their diet. So it, it makes logical, everyday common sense, whatever your family eats, feed your baby. So, and all these little rules we make about uh, feeding, uh, the best, the best thing to do is <laughs> eat your baby, uh, what you eat when the texture's fine. So I love that. That's a, that's a great ending, um, words of wisdom and evidence-based <laughs> recommendation <laughs> to get, to give patients and families. So we're at the end of our time. Do you have any um, final thoughts that you want to share with everyone, Dr. Hartz? No, I just want to say food allergic patients, um, you have hope for cures and treatments. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you everyone who listened. Um, and we want to remind everyone to stay healthy this winter season. Please uh, get your updated COVID boosters and influenza vaccines. And Dr. Hartz, thank you again for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.